of challenges when treating mandibular fractures with closed reductions using local anesthesia is to obtain adequate anesthesia for the patient. Of course, because patients oftentimes present with trismus as a result of their mandibular fracture, they cannot open adequately enough to allow us to give a standard inferior alveolar block injection. So some modified technique of anesthesia administration is indicated to enable us to work on these patients. So the injection that we typically use in cases where patients cannot open up their mouth to obtain mandibular block anesthesia is the Akinosi injection. The Akinosi injection technique is a closed mouth mandibular block injection which is given by having the patient go into full intercuspation and then inserting the needle close to the maxilla at the level of and parallel to the mucogingival junction of the maxilla. The needle is inserted posteriorly and angled in such a way so that it goes medial to the mandibular ramus. The needle is then pushed in as far as it will go until the body of the syringe abuts up against the ascending ramus of the mandible. After the needle is in position, you aspirate and check for bloody aspirate, and if it's negative, you can proceed to inject very, very slowly. What this does, similar to the standard inferior alveolar block injection, is it approximates the opening level of the mandibular canal and deposits local anesthetic in that vicinity. Following the administration of your mandibular block injections with the Akinosi technique, you might find that the patient's opening may improve from very slight, such as maybe 5 to 10 millimeters, to maybe 25 to 30 millimeters. The main reason why patients cannot open up their mouth following a mandibular fracture is due to guarding because it hurts to open up their mouth. So once you've given your block injections, it's more than likely that the patient is still not numb enough to allow you to work on them. So we can supplement the block injections by using an infiltration technique. And in the mandible, uh, typically infiltration techniques do not work with the exception of the anterior mandible. But if you have a posterior segment of the mandible which is fractured, and if you're able to deposit your anesthesia in the vicinity of the fracture close enough so that the anesthesia can diffuse into the fracture, you can then obtain infiltration anesthesia along the fracture site. As far as anesthetic agent of choice, I tend to use a non-epinephrine containing anesthetic for the block injections, but when I'm doing the infiltrations, I tend to use an, uh, an epinephrine uh, containing anesthetic. And perhaps the best anesthetic to use is septicane, uh, because not only does it contain epinephrine, but it also tends to diffuse very rapidly through tissues. So basically, if I'm doing an infiltration around the fracture, I try to locate the fracture site be it the angle, the body, the parasymphysis, or the symphysis area of the mandible. And then I just simply insert the needle into the area and I try and see if I can feel the crack of the fracture itself. Once I've identified that, you can inject into the, into the fracture itself or you can try and inject as close as you possibly can to the fracture. So by combining the technique of the closed mouth echinose mandibular block injection with infiltration anesthesia, to the fracture lines themselves, you can usually obtain an adequate amount of local anesthesia to be able to allow you to manipulate mandibular fractures and fixate them. Now, when we're wiring patients' jaws for mandibular fractures, we can't forget that the maxillary teeth have to be involved in the fixation also. To obtain maxillary anesthesia is a relatively simple procedure, though. Uh, all you need to do is to do local infiltrations over the teeth that you plan to involve in the fixation, just remembering to always give a palatal anesthetic injection also because wire placements go around the palatal aspects of the teeth and uh, patients will experience pain if you do not anesthetize the palate too. Once the patient is adequately anesthetized, they can oftentimes open up their mouth sufficiently to allow for the insertion of a bite block. I've inserted an adult bite block here for demonstration purposes, but usually this causes the patient to have too wide an opening. So I would say in most instances, a child or pediatric bite block is indicated for performing closed reductions.